Evacuating the seat of yourself, a necessary move for the scapegoat survivor. In most families, parents protect and respect their children. This protection and respect does not falter when the child needs something, nor when the child spontaneously expresses themselves. I like to think of human beings as having a seat in themselves that we can more or less occupy. A big factor that determines whether we can occupy our seat is the quality of our relationships. If we feel protected and respected when seated in ourselves, then we do so. Well, in the families I'm describing, the child learns to regard the seat of themselves as a sort of throne. It is a very comfortable seat to sit in. It affords them complete dominion over themselves. They do not require dominion over anyone else. And since they are in the center of themselves, they know what they want and what they don't want. And they know their desires will be respected, again, and protected. Life generally will feel hopeful, exciting, and fulfilling. Things are, of course, very different for the scapegoat child to the narcissistic parent. This child is deprived, devalued, and trapped by the parent. And under such conditions, occupying the seat of the scapegoat child's self is impossible. When the child tries to express or be themselves, they are met with hostility from the narcissistic parent. And this kind of repeated experience results in traumatic levels of shame for the child. Instead of the seat of themselves feeling like a throne, it feels much more dangerous. And with enough of this sort of abuse by the narcissistic parent, the seat of the scapegoat child's self can grow to feel like the electric chair. Now that's a grim, but I think fitting image. In this scenario, it is like the child is in the room and wanting to sit down, but of course dare not. I mean, because the seat looks like an electric chair. If they do, the narcissistic parent will pull the lever that sends the emotional voltage, i.e. shame, towards the child. The child would have committed the capital offense of thinking that they, the child, deserve protection and respect, uh, which would have led to them sitting in the seat of their, themselves. So the scapegoat child survives by learning not to inhabit the seat of themselves. In today's video, I describe how the scapegoat child's seat grew to feel like the electric chair. Next, I name the strategies used to stay out of that seat. Third, I explain how these strategies made it possible to survive a situation that you may really not have been meant to. And I hope you watch until the end because I'll offer three principles to help you gradually reoccupy the seat of yourself. Well, my name is Jay Reed and I'm a licensed psychotherapist in California and I specialize in helping people recover from narcissistic abuse. And this form of abuse can leave us feeling lost and estranged from our sense of who we are. In individual therapy and through my online course on recovery from narcissistic abuse, I try to offer a map that allows individuals to come back to the quality of life they know they deserve. And although each survivor needs to travel this path for themselves, a map can be a tremendously helpful uh, guide to do this with. And there are three features on this map that I refer to as the three pillars of recovery. The first pillar is making sense of what happened to eventually know it wasn't your fault. The second pillar is gaining distance, whether psychological, emotional, perhaps physical, uh, gaining distance from the narcissistic abuser. And the third pillar is living in defiance of the narcissist rules. And you can't do this in a vacuum. I think it's also essential to find and participate in communities of people who can get, validate, and support you on this path. Well, in my online course of recovery, in addition to the videos that correspond to the three pillars of recovery, I also offer a private Facebook group where um, course takers can uh, participate and both share their own story and support uh, those that they hear from other survivors. Um, Today's video falls under pillar number two, making sense of what happened so that you know it wasn't your fault. And if you were a scapegoat survivor of a narcissistic parent or partner, then I encourage you to check out my free ebook on the topic. It's called Surviving Narcissistic Abuse as the Scapegoat. It goes into other important aspects of what it's like to be in the shoes of the scapegoat child or partner of the narcissistic abuser. From self-limiting beliefs, about yourself that you may have had to adopt in order to survive this form of abuse, to why the narcissistic personality is so geared to put those closest to them down. 
This ebook can help you realize how none of this abuse was your fault, but was rather the product of the narcissist's own psychopathology. And you can find the link in the description box below or by clicking here. How the seat of oneself can become the electric chair. Living from the seat of yourself comes with a measure of vulnerability. This is where needs and desires exist. Our needs and desires require someone else to respond. Knowing you want to be comforted is great when you have someone there who's going to comfort you. Well, this vulnerability is a liability for the scapegoat child to the narcissistic parent. Since the narcissi <laughs> narcissistic parent sees this child's needs as inferior, they will likely ignore or rebuke the child for expressing them. And the scapegoat child who inhabits the seat of themselves experiences the agony of their needs going unmet. On top of this, they have to deal with the parent's attitude that the child does not deserve to have their needs met in the first place. When we express a need or a desire and are met with indifference or contempt, we feel shame. Shame is an emotion that makes us want to disappear. A narcissistic parent who disregards the scapegoat child's self-expression burns the bridge of connection for that child. Where the child is hoping to have an appreciative reception, they're instead uh, reacted to like a contemptible or burdensome object. And it is feeling like an object instead of feeling like an understood other subject that can create the feeling of shame. Being on the receiving end makes the child associate traumatic levels of shame with occupying the seat of themselves. Shame shocks us. We just want it to be over when it arises. Thus the similarity with the scapegoat child's self growing to feel like the electric chair. As the child's attempts to live from what they need or desire is met with rebuke, the child is shocked. With enough of these experiences, the child learns to stay out of the seat of themselves altogether. So I wanna offer uh, another fictionalized example. Chris was a scapegoat child to a narcissistic mother and father. He was in therapy to uncover and embrace his needs and desires today. He would recall his mother talking on the phone to friends for hours at a time when he was three or four years old. He would plead with her to pay attention to him and she would roll her eyes at him and turn away. He said that he grew demoralized at ever getting her to prioritize him. In therapy, we pieced together how he learned to ignore his needs for others' attention in order to spare himself the shame of going ignored like he was so often with his mother. As Chris grew older, his mother would fix her gaze at him and find a reason to react with disgust. If he cleared his throat, she would exclaim, what a disgusting habit that was to everyone within earshot. If she saw him standing, she would say he had terrible posture. If he answered the phone, she would criticize how he greeted the caller. He grew to feel like whatever came out of him would disgust others. In therapy, we understood how Chris would stay away from the seat of himself because he also expect other, expected others to recoil if he was himself. How the scapegoat child stays out of their seat. Well, the scapegoat child cannot stay in the seat of themselves under such conditions. They need a strategy to limit the damage of the shame that is gonna be threatening them. One strategy is to turn away from one's seat, to live through the eyes of the narcissistic parent instead of the child's own eyes. Doing so affords the child protection from such trauma of the shame because they are not acting from the seat of themselves. When the parent criticizes the scapegoat child, there is now a sort of buffer. The child does not feel real, so the parent's attacks seem less devastating, as if the child does not know who the parent is in fact devaluing and depriving. Staying out of the seat of oneself takes a lot of psychological energy. The child must be occupied with people and tasks that, are, that seem separate from themselves. Life can grow to feel like a bunch of episodes strung together, filled with anxiety that must be gotten through rather than experienced. It may be filled with thoughts such as, did I say the right thing to that, to that person? Where am I with that project at work? If I don't say the right thing to my partner, they're going to hate me. And so it goes. Those could be the refrains of the scapegoat survivor later as an adult. 
um, going back to the scapegoat child's inner experience, they will get sort of suffused with these mini emergencies, which all require uh, the child's complete attention. And this functions to keep the child's attention away from themselves and then effectively themselves out of the seat of their own experience. Now back to the example of Chris, he remembered in high school realizing that he could not stop himself from caring more about what others thought than what he thought himself. And this pained him. He felt like he had lost his integrity as a person. At the time, he had no idea that he was being abused and neglected by his narcissistic parents. His father offered him no protection, so he had to forge his own. He spared himself the pain of his mother's attacks by seeing himself through her eyes. He could now anticipate what might set her off and then try to prevent it. The cost for him was feeling like he was not living his life through his own eyes. He also had to see himself as defective and undeserving in the way his mother did. And this led to him having very low self-worth. He would have the ongoing experience of feeling fraudulent as a person. Were his acts of seeming kindness and decency real? He doubted it. He could not discover a feeling of integrity in himself nor in his life. The hardest times for Chris were when he had free time. Since he was out of the seat of himself, he did not know what he wanted. Desires and needs generally take over when we're free to choose our own direction. He had to repel such experience within, so free time meant a vague but terrible feeling of directionlessness. So reoccupying the seat of yourself. Scapegoat survivors never leave the room of the seat of themselves. Yeah, maybe feel like an electric chair, but there's still this kind of nearness to it. They have to distract themselves, I think to an amazing degree, but are still near the seat. The question becomes why? I believe it reflects the survivor's tenacity to find and reclaim the seat of themselves. Survivors know that something is amiss internally, and I'm constantly amazed at how hard they will fight and endure to set things right internally. Well, as you start your recovery, you can recognize that your seat became electrified, not by you or something inherent, but by your narcissistic parent and the shame you felt and may still feel when you try to occupy the seat of yourself does not actually reflect who you are. And it's okay if those are just thoughts at the outset. Um, over time, it can grow to feel like one's real experience. There was an, an imposter in your seat the whole time. The narcissistic parent projects their own sense of worthlessness onto the scapegoat child. Next, they treat the child as worthless so that the child mistakes these feelings as the child's own. And this is a process that's known as pathological projective identification. And that's a mouthful, but the result is that the child can see a disgusting, defective, and worthless version of themselves in the seat of their own experience. So that when the child goes to live from that seat, they can feel like they are being that worthless person. As recovery progresses, you get to discover that the version of yourself you thought occupied this seat was never really you. That that version of you was a disguise that your narcissistic, narcissistic parent wore to get their unwanted feelings into you. Surround yourself with safe people. You hear that a lot on this channel, but for good reason. Um, this type of discovery that it's now safe to occupy the seat of your experience is a big undertaking. You're giving up a long-held, albeit painful, way of knowing who you are. And as you kick the projected version of you out of the seat of your experience, you'll need to know that you have other people in your life who care about you. You'll need to know that the vulnerability of living from the seat of yourself and your experience will be respected and protected by the people in your life. Give yourself time. I, again, this is a big undertaking. You're working to discover that occupying the seat of yourself will not end in disaster like it used to. The rewards are great, but historic danger has been even greater. This process of, of recovering your, the seat of yourself tends to be long-term and incremental. So the more compassion and patience you can offer yourself along the way, the better. Compassion and patience in, in attitude towards yourself is always an antidote uh, to the feeling of shame that can be so familiar 
and hurtful as the scapegoat child to the narcissistic parent. Well, thank you for watching today. I hope you found today's video helpful. I want to thank you uh, again for your continued engagement and support of this channel. Um, it's just, again, so heartening to see the brave comments that are left um, by, by viewers and um, the support, you know, offered uh, to one another and the very um, interesting and important and stimulating questions and comments and observations that are brought up on the video. So as always, thank you. And um, I look forward to posting again next Friday. Take care.